Dear Jesus, we uh, thank you so much for uh, this morning that each of us on Zoom and in person can be here. God, it's, it's been sort of a crazy uh, week with a crazy storm, but we're just thankful that we're cleaning up and, and getting back to it. And so, Lord, I just pray um, as we uh, meet today and as we even meet on Sunday that uh, you would work in our hearts and in our lives, that you would help us to understand what it is exactly you want us to learn uh, here. And God, I just thank you um, for your sacrifice, that you came and died for our sins and rose again from the dead, that we can have life. I do pray for each person here, Lord, those of us who know, know you, those of us who don't, I just pray that you'd give us the grace uh, to be able to uh, come to know you better. And I do pray for myself, God, that you'd give me the grace I need to be able to do what I'm called to do, and I pray for, for open eyes and ears, and I'm just thankful for everything you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we have been uh, walking through this series together, and um, I hope it's been helpful uh, comparing and contrasting the claims of Jesus with what the rest of the world uh, says about him. Today, I want to answer this question, and then I'm going to go off on its own little tangent. Why should we place our trust in Jesus alone? <clears throat> what has Jesus accomplished for us on the cross that makes him worthy of that trust? Now, of course, there's much we can say about this, right? But I want to go to the scene uh, that Andy just read, uh, but I'm going to go to Luke's version, Luke 22, 39 to 44. So Mark has his version. Luke has his. He gives us a couple of more details. Let's read it. And then I want to answer a question here this morning. So Luke 22, 39 to 44, the same story. Here's what it says. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This is the question I want to answer here this morning. What was so terrifying to Jesus in this place that he says his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death? And I think if we can find the answer to this question, we will learn why Jesus is worthy of our complete trust. This is a very interesting story because all over the Gospels, if you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we never see Jesus distressed and terrified like this. Never. <clears throat> and so something is on his mind about what's about to happen that is making him either sweat blood or sweat, you know, um, sweat as thick as blood. Either way, it's, it's an incredible amount of stress he's under. And Jesus prays earnestly, asking the Father that if possible, this hour might pass from him. Now, the hour in the book of John, uh, of course, talks about that time of his death, right? That's the hour he's always talking about. Now, he talks about this cup he is going to drink from, and he asks if it can be taken from him. Now, he ends it by saying, whatever you want to do, God, I will do. But he does ask for this cup to pass from him. Now, th the story to me is really just incredible in many ways, because, again, we look at the life and ministry of Jesus all throughout the Gospels. Jesus is powerful and bold and confident and true and unwavering in all he says and does. His opponents come at him. He deflects it easily, right? His disciples ask ridiculous questions or embarrass themselves. Jesus shows grace and continues to instruct them and love them. Over and over in the life of Jesus, we see consistency and strength coming from him. That is until now. And so there is something in this cup, this figurative cup, he is about to drink that is so terrifying, so full of sorrow, so full of anguish, so unsettling, that in the only time I can think of in the Bible, he asks the Father if there is any other way. He knows what the plan is, and yet he asks, is there any other way? Now the fact that Jesus submits his will to the Father and goes on to drink this cup shows us that there is no other way. This had to happen if salvation was going to be accomplished for the world. 
but I want to answer this question for the rest of our time. What was in the cup? Why did it bring such sorrow and terror to his heart? And again, I think if we can find the answer to this question, we'll discover why Jesus is worthy of our trust. So, what was in the cup? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is his crucifixion. He's about to be arrested, beaten, flogged, which was not fun. You could die from flogging. And, of course, crucifixion, which was a a brutal form of torture and, of course, of execution. There's no doubt this weighed heavily on his mind, and he knew it was not going to be easy. But here's what uh, I will counter that with. We know from church history that this was not the thing that terrified Jesus about the cup. Why? Because you can go to books like Fox's Book of Martyrs or, or read church history, and what do you find? All throughout church history, there are Christians arrested by the Roman government, sent to crosses to die, just like Jesus, and they are going to the crosses, singing and worshiping and praising God. Interesting. All the way to their death. Ignatius was a church father. In 108 AD, he said this right before his execution. We have it recorded. He's about to be killed by lions. This is what he says. Quote, now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may win but Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. And even when he was sentenced to be thrown to the beasts, such as the burning desire that he had to suffer, that he spoke. What time he heard the lions roaring, he said this, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found purebred. End quote. Dozens of stories like this you can find throughout church history. And so we have Christians who, many of them weren't even alive during the time and ministry of Jesus, boldly giving their lives for him. They go on to die horrible martyrs' death with no fear. Incredible stories you can read in Fox's Book of Martyrs and other places. And so here's the question. If the cup that Jesus wanted taken away from him was simply a Roman cross and some nails, and if he shuddered in sorrow and terror under the weight of it, and yet Christians afterward were able to endure these horrible things with great joy, are we saying that the author of our salvation God himself in human flesh was scared of this, yet his followers later weren't? No, indeed, there was something much more in the cup. Now, if we can find out who gave Jesus this figurative cup, it will help us to understand why it wasn't just simple, simply physical suffering on the cross as bad as it was. John 18 verse 11 says this, right at his arrest, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? So who gave Jesus the cup? Was it the Roman soldiers? Was it the Jews? Was it Judas? No, God the Father gave him this cup. And so we know much more happened on the cross of Jesus Christ. And there's so much here. Maybe I'll spend the next five Good Fridays breaking each of them down. So we know at least a couple things happened to him on the cross. Of course, we know that Jesus was a blood sacrifice. All throughout the Old Testament, this is pictured by the lamb being sacrificed at Passover and so forth. We know this was necessary for our salvation. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says this, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death. For everyone, for you and for me, he tasted death. The scripture goes on. There's so much more to say. If we simply say that Jesus was be, Have you ever asked this, maybe ask yourself this question. How does Jesus being beat up by a bunch of Roman soldiers and being nailed to a piece of wood pay for your sin? How does that pay for the sins of the world? He bore our sin for us. That is why. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. For he made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter 2.24 says, 
he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. And so what does it mean that Jesus bore our sins? It means that he took them from us off our shoulders and he carried them. And so on the cross, God the Father took all of our sin and placed it on Jesus. But wait, there's more. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, which he did. It says in Galatians that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We no longer have to fear being cursed because of our disobedience, because he has redeemed us and saved us from the penalties of our disobedience to the law. But how did he do this? He became a curse for us. What does that mean? This is important. Recall our previous point. Jesus has our sins on him, the sins of the entire world placed on him. He is legally bearing our sin. And so in the eyes of God, it had become as if he had committed all of those sins. According to Deuteronomy 28, what happens to those who break, break God's law? What are the consequences of it? You're cursed by God. And so Jesus, bearing all of my sin, is cursed by God as a lawbreaker, even though, here's the thing, he had never broken any of those laws himself. That is crazy. He was cursed so that we don't have to be. But there's even more. What does Jesus say on the cross? Mark 15, 34, at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, limo sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we don't catch this aspect of the gospel, we've missed a big part. Everything that we deserved, Jesus gets on the cross. Martin Luther called it the great exchange. Everything I deserved, he received. Everything I don't deserve, I get from him. He takes my sin, I get his righteousness. Right, and so we know, as we've said, he dies as a bloody sacrifice, just like that Passover lamb in the Old Testament. He carries the full weight of my sins. He's cursed as a lawbreaker, even though he had no sin. But from his cry on the cross, we see that Jesus was also separated. That's what, that's, that's what it means to be forsaken. It means to leave behind or to, de, or to desert someone. Jesus is separated from the Father on the cross. Think about how terrible this really was. Who is Jesus? He's God. How long was he in relationship with the Father before he came here? For all eternity. And so there was a time when God becomes a man, and there's a time in human history where this relationship in the Trinity, something happens. Something separates, something breaks, and we can't really understand how horrible that was. To know someone that intimately and to have that relationship end for a time is an inconceivable loss. That I don't think we can comprehend. Maybe we've lost a spouse, a parent, someone we care about. We think about that relationship ending. But no, this is far, far, far worse. Being separated from his father. Why was he separated from his father? Because you and I deserve to be separated from the father. That's why. And so though, though Jesus had Judas betray him, all of his disciples flee, flee him, he always had his father with him. But... On the cross, Jesus was completely and utterly alone, forsaken by his Father. And yet there's more, and if we don't grasp number five of this point, maybe we've missed the whole thing. This is what happened on the cross. Suffered. He suffered under the full weight of God's wrath for us. Maybe you've never heard that before. This is the part that is the most controversial, but without it, I don't think we'll fully understand what happened that day. Because again, what do I deserve for my sin? The wrath of God. So Jesus has to drink that, doesn't he? And so to understand this, we need to first come to grips with what happens to someone who dies in their sin apart from the grace of God. We often talk about hell as being eternal separation from God, and there is truth to that right? The person in hell is not in a relationship with God, right? He's not feeling the grace and goodness of God. Everything good in life that the unbeliever enjoyed will be gone forever, but that doesn't go far enough. You have your Bible, Revelation 14, 9 to 11. Revelation 14, 9 to 11. Speaking, of course, of what I just talked about. 
A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. The cup of his what? They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of his name. Here's a question. If you have your Bible open, you can see it in verse 10. When it talks about this horrible place of burning sulfur, where is God? Where is God? He's there in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. The, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, as Revelation describes him, is there. Where did you think he was? God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. There is nowhere he cannot be. What is he doing there? The verse tells us the people in hell are drinking the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. Again, did you catch that word? Where is his wrath against sin found? In the cup. This language is used all throughout Scripture. I'll give you one more example. Jeremiah 25, 15 to 16. It says this, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. And so in order to save us from our sin and the consequences of it, Jesus had to go through everything that would have otherwise happened to us if we had to face God alone on Judgment Day, which means the wrath that we deserved to be poured out on us forever, and in fact, in Revelation 14, will be poured out on some people, was poured out on Jesus while he hung on that cross. Don't believe me? Turn to your Bible, Isaiah 53, verse 10. Speaking of Jesus, I recommend the whole chapter. Look what it says. Speaking of Jesus' death under the wrath of God, yet, Isaiah 53.10, yet it was the Lord's will, or the New King James says, it pleased God to crush him and cause him to suffer. Who's causing Jesus to suffer? The Father. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Why? And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, whose sin? My sin. Your sin. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And so instead of crushing us under his wrath, he crushes Jesus instead in our place. So what was in the cup? The wrath of Almighty God was in the cup. Do you see why Jesus was so terrified and so, so full of sorrow? And maybe what some of you are thinking is, no, that's wrong, that's sick, it doesn't seem right. You're saying it pleased God to crush his one and only son. You know, this is called, you, you Bible nerds will know this is called penal substitution, penal substitutionary atonement, and there are many people who are very angry at this doctrine and very upset. Even churches, and especially the world, hates this doctrine. Many churches will call this simply divine child abuse. Jesus had to beat up his son for your sins. That doesn't make any sense. But this is what the Bible teaches, that it pleased God to crush his one and only son under the full weight of his anger. And God did this for a very specific reason. He did it for us. He did it for you. He did it for me. Jesus became our substitute in our place so that we would not have to face God's wrath for our sins forever and ever in hell. Those are your, those are your two choices. You can face the wrath yourself or Jesus took it for you. There is no third option. Now here's the good news to use maybe another metaphor. When Jesus was done drinking this cup of wrath, he could take the cup and he could tip it upside down, and not a single drop came out. Justice had been completely satisfied. 
justice was done on our behalf. And now because I believe in him, I no longer have to bear the punishment that I deserve. He's taken it all from me. See, because we, I, you, deserve far more than just the physical death for what we've done. I deserve, I don't know about you, maybe you're perfect, but I deserve to be separated from God and to be under his wrath forever and ever in a place called hell. But praise God, and this is what Good Friday is all about, he loved me and he gave himself for me and he gave himself for you. And so I no longer have to fear that day of judgment. Not in the same way. Maybe I have to stand before him, of course, for rewards. But I don't have to fear that day of judgment. Why? Because everything that I deserve to suffer as a sinner, as a God-hater, as a blasphemer, and as a lawbreaker was all taken by Jesus. He suffered in my place so that I would never have to. Can you imagine how heavy the sins of the entire world were? Not just of that time, but, of all, but for all time. And can you imagine the infinite anger God feels about that sin? Every murder, every rape, every blasphemous word ever uttered, uttered against God, committed by you, committed by me, every injustice our world has ever seen, the sins of Hitler even, all of it placed on Jesus. Who else can handle that but God? No man can handle that. Only God can handle that. Only God can do what God has done. And so why is Jesus worthy of our trust? He did for us what no one else ever could. He, did in my, he died in my place in the way that I deserved so that I will never have to. And that is amazing news. <coughs> now, two points and then we're done. And I thank you for being with us and listening. One for you if you're not a Christian, one for you if you are. If God himself in human flesh is terrified of the wrath of God, we should tremble for our friends, family, neighbors, and even folks in this room maybe who do not know Jesus. Because in a short while, they will have a terrible thing to face. The cup that shook Jesus to the core in the garden will be handed to them, and they will have to drink it for themselves. They will have to face the judge of the universe with no lawyer. They will have to face the one who ironically was willing to pay their price, but they refused. And that's the tragedy with all of this. That's the scandal. No one has to go to hell. But so many will end up there because they have rejected the gift of salvation. And so the stern warning for you if you do not know Jesus, is to accept that free gift he offers you. He doesn't make it complicated. He doesn't make it hard. He's done it all, but you need, to, you need to believe in him. You need to believe in him. And so it will be wise for you to deal with your heart before you leave today. Now, dear Christian, I'll finish with this. There is incredible encouragement from this. When I hear sermons like this, it encourages me. It doesn't get me upset. It doesn't offend me. Because now I don't have to take this for myself. So here's a question for you. Great encouragement, I hope. If Jesus had the full weight of God's anger against your sin poured out on him to the extent that when you turn this cup over, there isn't a single drop of it left. Here's a question for you, dear Christian. What does God think of you now? Is God angry with you? Is God disappointed in you? Is he frustrated with you? Is he hovering over you just waiting for you to screw up so that he can squash you like a bug? Is he ready to take away your salvation because of the slightest screw up or mistake? How about when you make a really big mistake? Can you get so far gone that God will stop coming for you? Well, because Jesus absorbed the wrath of God for you on the cross, the answer to all of those questions is a resounding no. God loves you and is pleased with you, not because of you, but because Jesus is pleasing to him. And the righteousness of Jesus has now been given to you. We're going to learn about this a lot in the book of Romans starting in May. I'm very excited. But this is only possible for us because Jesus suffered and died under the full weight of the wrath 
of God. And so does this doctrine, does this truth affect our relationship with God to the point where I no longer fear condemnation? When I sin, do I look for God's loving hand of discipline in my life, but not his anger and his judgment? The good news is that God is no longer wrathful towards the true believer in Jesus. Why? Because all of his anger and his justice against my sin was poured out on Jesus in my place. Justice demands that, justice demands that crimes be punished, and our crimes were punished in Jesus. That's why Romans says that Jesus can both be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So now that my sin has been dealt with as a believer, what's left for me? Now I can receive God's full love, God's full grace, his unmerited favor. The one who was my judge is now my heavenly father. Isn't that crazy? That is great news. And so why should we trust our, place our trust in Jesus alone? Because he died in my place and suffered under the full weight of our sin and absorbed God's wrath for us. No other religious figure, which we've been sharing here over the last five weeks, or belief system out there even comes close to understanding or explaining this, let alone accomplishing it. But Jesus did, and therefore he is worthy of our trust, our absolute trust and obedience alone. Amen? Heavy one, but an important one. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful once again for your love for us, for your grace. Jesus, that you went to the cross and died for us, that it was a bloody sacrifice, it was a brutal sacrifice, that you were the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament pictures and types and shadows of the lamb being slaughtered. You are indeed, Jesus, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Thank you as well, Jesus, that you bore my sin on the cross, that everything I have ever done was placed on you. I'm so ashamed, God, that even had to happen. I wish I could have lived a perfect life of obedience to you, but I have been born sinful like everyone else. And because of that, Jesus, my sin had to be placed on you. Thank you, Jesus, that you were cursed in my place. Those who break the law are doomed to be cursed, and yet, Jesus, you became a curse for us so that my disobedience doesn't need to be punished. Thank you, Jesus, that you were separated from God in, in the way that we deserve to be forever in hell. Somehow, some way, the Trinity had a rift for a time. And thank you, Jesus, that you did that for me and for us. And Jesus, whatever anger God had against our sin has been redirected towards you. The flood of God's wrath was coming for us, and yet the, the earth opened up and swallowed it all up. In Jesus' name, you did that for us. And so what else can we do, God, other than worship you for this? And to humble ourselves and to live for you. We owe you our lives. We owe you our eternities. We owe you our very souls. And yet, God, we are still sinful. We are new creatures, but we still have an old nature. We still struggle. And so, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to continue to work out our, to continue to work out our salvation. And so help us, Lord to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to really figure out if we are right with you. And if we are, Lord, to live for you, maybe in a way that we never have before. So thank you, Lord, that Good Friday is so good for us, but we know that it was not good for you. We thank you for this amazing time together, that this snow uh, it has come down, but we've cleaned it up. And even as we sing our final song together, Lord, we lift up our praises to you as someone who has paid our price, who has set us free, and who has allowed us to have life. That is something we can never pay you back for. And we don't think we owe you for it, but boy, Lord, we want to live for you. We want to live for you. In Jesus' name.